Welcome, everyone. I'm Sam Toby. I'm the gallery director of the University Hall Gallery and Arts on the Point here at UMass Boston. Thank you all for coming to the public program and reception for our current exhibition, From Theory to Practice, Trajectories of the Whitney Independent Study Program. The exhibition presents a selection of artworks from some of the most influential faculty, participants, and seminar leaders at the ISP with an intention of tracking the ways in which the program has had a strong effect and continues to influence critical approaches in art making as well as theorizing and historicizing visual, visual art and culture in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. In organizing this exhibition, my colleague John Tyson and I looked closely at how these artists have been influenced by their participation in the ISP, how they have interjected their, their own ideas into the program, and most importantly, how they have influenced one another within the extended network of artists, writers, and curators. To quote some language from the Whitney Museum of American Arts website, the ISP provides a setting within which students pursuing art practice, curatorial work, art historical scholarship, and critical writing engage in ongoing discussions and debates that examine the historical, social, and intellectual conditions of artistic production. The program encourages the, the theoretical and critical study of the practices, institutions, and discourses that constitute the field of culture. So this educa educational environment, uh, end quote, excuse me. This educational environment has created a discursive network of makers and theorists that have exchanged ideas and discourses around art and culture for five decades. It has helped generate major modes of art making, including video performance, institutional critique, social practice art, and art activism, among others uh, which we will discuss here tonight. We organized this discussion in hopes to contextualize the exhibition within these, these histories as well as grapple with the, pedago the pedagogy and effect of the ISP beyond its classrooms to look at some models of education that influenced the founding of the ISP as well as those that were sparked by it. Tonight we're here to hear the voices and perspectives of a few significant par participants of the program. I'm humbled and thrilled to be joined by the artist and educator Hans Hacke, uh, art historian and curator Gloria Sutton, uh, and my colleague and co-curator co John Tyson. The program will consist of two presentations, one by John on the history of the ISP, as well as some readings and connections between artworks in the exhibition, and the second by Gloria Sutton on her experience in the ISP and beyond, as well as some of her recent work. These will be followed by a discussion where we will bring Hans Hacke to the stage to discuss his, his practice and work in the program, finishing with a Q&A, uh, finishing with a Q&A. After the, after the discussion at 7 p.m., we will move to the gallery on the first floor in the room 1220 for the reception where some light food and refreshments will be, will be served. Um, some housekeeping items before we move into the introductions. If you have a cell phone, uh, please remember to silence your device. And while you have your phones out, please take a moment to follow us on social media by our handle, at UHGallery. I'd like to thank the Art Department, the College of Liberal Arts, the Visiting Artist Lecture Series, and the Paul Hayes Tucker Fund for supporting this event, uh, as well as our programming of the gallery. Thank you to all the lenders of these works uh, of art for entrusting us with their care and display. And I would also like to thank, uh, also like to extend a, a sincere thanks to my colleague and co-curator, John A. Tyson, uh, who's propo who proposed this, ex this excellent ex exhibition idea early last year. Uh, my sin sincere thanks to you uh, for your practice, your knowledge of the ISP artists, and for being such a wonderful and true collaborator throughout this process. Yes, thanks, John. Um, so about the speakers, Hans Hacke was born in Cologne, Germany in 1936. He has lived in New York City since 1965. Hacke taught at the Cooper Union School of Art in New York between 1967 and 2002. He's pr he has presented solo exhibitions uh, at venues such as the Museum House uh, Lang in Krefeld in 1972, Museum of Modern Art at Oxford in 1978, the Renaissance Society in Chicago in 1979, the Tate Gallery in London in 1984, the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York 1986, the Centre Pompidou in Paris 1987, the Venice Biennale in 1993, Porticus Frankfurt in 2000, uh, the Serpentine Gallery in 2001, and the Reina Sofia Madrid in 2012, among others. Uh, this fall, the new museum will be presenting a major rep retrospective of his work, um, the first major American museum exhibition surveying Hacke's practice in over 30 years. His work has been included in five documentas, a uh, sculptor project in Munster, biennials in Venice, Sao Paulo, Sydney, Tokyo, Johannesburg, uh, Gu Guangzhou, uh, Sarya, uh, and at the Whitney Biennial in, in New York. He shared the 
the Golden Lion Award for the German Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 1993 with Nam Jun Pek, and he participates in the Whitney ISP as a seminar leader. Gloria Sutton is Associate Professor in Contemporary Art History at Northeastern University and Research Affiliate in the Art, Culture, Technology Program at MIT. She participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program in 1997 through 98 in the critical studies portion of the program. Uh, Sutton's book, The Experience Machine, Stan Vanderbeek's Movie Drome and Expanded Cinema was the first study um, of, of a single member of the American avant-garde whose experimental artworks combined the logic of, of painting, film, video, pr photography, dance, television, and computer, computer programming and architecture to anticipate the, w the current ways contemporary art operates under the pressure of digital networks. Um, our first speaker is my colleague John A. Tyson. He is an assistant professor of art history at UMass Boston. From 2015 to 2007, he held an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral post curatorial fellowship at the National Gallery of Art. He recently developed a monograph on Hans Hacke, Beyond Systems and Aesthetics. His recent publications have addressed Hacke's early systems works and prints links between art and new wave cinema and modernism in Washington, D.C. Will you please join me in welcoming John Tyson. Right. Th thank you very much, Sam, for that kind introduction. And I would just also uh, like to thank our, our lenders uh, and the department as well for the support of this exhibition. So. Uh, the Whitney Independent Study Program, often known by its initials as the ISP, is a kind of alternate art school for budding artists, art historians, and curators. After a trial semester in fall 1967, it officially began in spring of 68, a historical moment characterized by its radical politics and revolutionary culture. Ron Clark, the ISP's driving force and its director since 1981, was hired to helm the program's studio side in 67. Though the ISP forms part of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the program has always enjoyed a great degree of autonomy and has been physically separate from the museum. Indeed, one of its goals was to critique existing forms of art education. Hence, it is best understood as a kind of anti-institution. Different Whitney Museum directors have viewed it more or less favorably, Adam Weinberg, the current director and a champion of the ISP, nonetheless describes the program as, quote, a productive irritant, encapsulating its at times agonistic stance. The format, structure, and curriculum have shifted since the ISP's creation. It has generally involved a combination of guest lectures, critiques, and a significant reading load. Today, participants in three tracks, studio, critical, and curatorial, all convene for bi-weekly seminars led by Clark or a visiting luminary, usually an artist, art historian, or theorist of culture. And indeed, it was in the ISP uh, where I first met Hans Hacke uh, when I was writing a dissertation on him. Um, the year culminates in an exhibition for the dozen studio participants, a co-curated show by the four curatorial fellows, and a colloquium in which the six critical studies students present their research. However, while these events might raise a participant's professional profile, it's not obligatory to produce anything during the nine-month term. From 1989 until the late 90s, the artist Mary Kelly shared much of the teaching with Clark as head of the studio program. Also during this time, Hal Foster and then Benjamin Buclo headed the curatorial and critical studies program. The reading list and guest list have changed over the years too. According to Howard Singerman's insightful account of the program, by the late 70s or early 80s, the ISP had come to resemble its current format with its strong emphasis on reading and debating critical theories. Uh, a characteristic that anticipates directions in art history, but was actually artist driven and originated in the studio program. Uh, let me zoom over. Uh, a 1980 ISP handbook, complete with reading list, provides some sense of its intellectual currents. The program often faces charges of being overly insular or orthodox. Uh, these are only partially correct in my mind. While there are certain canonical texts and some frequent visitors, Clark does react to participant requests and brings in new seminar leaders, though often these are people who have gone through the ISP crucible themselves. Arguably, its long-standing embrace of performance, 
embodied by instructor Yvonne Rayner, serves as a corrective to the drier, headier conceptual currents that undergird many participants' oeuvres. This announcement from the Golden Age of Art Forum ads emphasizes a sweaty corporeality, albeit one conforming to quite traditional notions of masculine physicality, rather than just the heavy lifting of big ideas. Beyond the organized classroom activities, part of the program's value comes from the informal conversations and connections that emerge around the seminar. Film screenings, visits to exhibitions, bull sessions at the bar, and in Rayner's words, quote, hanging around Ron's desk, um, are all parts of the program. Indeed, when writing about participation while preparing texts for the show, I stumbled over the prepositions typically used with individuals' time in institutions, like at or in, which work for other institutes of learning. They feel like an awkward fit that doesn't quite encompass the program. One instead does the ISP, suggesting too linguistically, it is a more all-encompassing model of pedagogy. Carrie Rickey's account of the ISP at its 15th anniversary uh, implies it is an art world finishing school, but also the opposite, she quotes as, quote, a fine arts beginning school. Uh, George Baker compares it to the early Soviet Inkhook, the entity charged with determining the directions uh, of experiments in and beyond art in revolutionary Russia. Uh, artist Greg Bordowitz found the program to be more like Hebrew school. Uh, and Black Mountain College, with its combination of dancers and visual artists, uh, also seems to be a clear precedent as well. Uh, in fact, it was a result of listening to an interview with ISP alumna Helen Molesworth, in which she just discussed her and Ruth Erickson's Leap Before You Look, a show that maybe some people here saw at the ICA looking at uh, Black Mountain College, um, that I had the idea to develop an ISP exhibition that would coincide with the 2018-19 50th anniversary year. Uh, engagements with a common body of theories and tactics results in a generative, intergenerational field of production. Mirroring the logic of the program's seminars in the ISP network, flows of influence and exchange do not merely move in a single direction. And I'm gonna just jump over that for a second. Uh, Mark Dion's Stegosaurus presents a genealogical diagram that raises questions about the boundaries between natural and cultu cultural history. Uh, his debts to Haka and Martha Rosler are acknowledged as well, uh, if we look at the, the tail of the Stegosaurus. Uh, in turn, Hans Haka renews the stack form from the late Felix Gonzalez Torres, an ISP alum uh, from 1980 to 81, uh, for some of the iterations of his current We All Are the People. Uh, Greg Bordowitz's fast trip, long drop, taps various generations with cameos from Rayner, Andrea Frazier, and as a girl, the media theorist and future ISP alumna, Nadja Milder Larson. Additionally, Martha Rosler, an ISP instructor, produces a still image recalling Bordowitz's pan of his bookshelves. Coming full circle, it was Rosler's videos that inspired him to use the medium in the first place. Uh, and I would just note that the same Dijon mustard-colored Shokin Books edition of Walter Benjamin's Illuminations graces both of their shelves. In 1983, Clark affirmed, quote, for all of us, there is the feeling that art is the ground on which important intellectual struggles are waged. Uh, I think his comments still ring true. The tactics born in May 68 and the 1980s, which saw a return of the 30s, of course, feel more urgent and necessary than ever. The idea of art as a form of knowledge production has had political implications, uh, as the ISP's uh, embroilments in the cultural wars might suggest, and that's where that newspaper headline comes from. Um, as, anxi as anxieties about Marxism and socialism have a long history in this country, and as the US two-party system effectively prevents smaller groups from getting government representation, the realm of art, and perhaps the academy too, are spaces where uh, sometimes radical, sometimes more salon, uh, new left politics can be variously adopted, adapted, and given afterlives. Thank you very much. I love that art historical close reading of all of those great objects, John. That was really marvelous to see. And also, um, I'm going to keep my uh, points. Let's see if I forward a little. Am I going the right way or the wrong way, Sam? You're going okay. The right way. I, I okay. Back. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep my points conversational and short because essentially I want to get to the um, 
kind of mimic a lot of what we did at the ISP, which was conversation and contestation, um, and make it very dialogical to get Hans up here quickly. Um, I would just say my research on networks and media and feminism was motivated by my participation in the ISP as a critical studies fellow in 97, 98, when I was introduced to the work of Renee Green and Mary Kelly, whose vital art practices continue to demonstrate that seminar is a site of production, a lesson I strive to enact in my own teaching. And so one of the questions that was posed to me today was sort of to think about how the ISP impacted my own scholarship. And I would essentially say the best way I can encapsulate that was that the ISP basically helped me understand how marginality is both a subject and a methodology for my teaching and my research. And so I, I'm going to flip through a, f a few sets of slides, um, mostly just to kind of um, to spur some conversations and, and, and add a little sort of bookmarks to things that hopefully many of us can pick up in the room. There's a lot of great voices in here today that um, would be great to hear from. Modeling the ways that Renee Green formed Free Agent Media and Mary Kelly her, and her colleagues in London formed Screen Magazine, my generation were also seeking a platform for the ideas that we were committed to, namely the ways that media and networked technology were shaping and modeling models of communication. Hence the reason why, um, and this is an installation of Renee Green's work, if you're not familiar with it, um, somebody who, an artist that I'm lucky and, and privileged to call a colleague in town and ha, um, had the opportunity to work with um, on a series of exhibitions that maybe many of you had seen at the Carpenter Center recently. But during my time at the Whitney, what was interesting to me was the way in which, again, it, it seems sort of far afield to say this now, but you know, when I was sitting in the audience and listening to Mary Kelly talk about the ways in which she didn't have a venue for her um, convictions and interests in psychoanalysis, or the way that um, her colleagues didn't have a place for discourse around feminism and film, um, and so hence why they started Screen. As a working class person myself, and the only person to go to college in my family, let alone get a PhD, I already felt like a black sheep. And so I sat there fuming and angry. How do you live in London and start up your own journal? How would you actually you know, pay your rent? Um, so when I was in the ISP, I worked for commercial print magazines, Entertainment Weekly, Interview Magazine, and Condé Nast. I still live off the frequent flyer miles that I had amassed during my time working in the marketing departments of those publications. So that's what paid for me to be in New York at the same time, to be committed to another group of kind of, I would say, um, destitute people working on arcane pieces of knowledge. Um, it was probably the most privileged I've ever been and quite the happiest, so there's some correlation there. But essentially, my time at the Whitney um, overlapped with um, people like, you know, being in and around this moment where I felt like the debates that we were having around digital culture and new media were not happening in the museums. They were definitely not happening in the art history departments um, or the speakers that were coming into the program. But they were happening and coalescing around an organization, that, a fledgling organization called rhizome.org. And this was a moment, um, and sort of, you know, with, with, um, programmers, artists, curators who were coming together to think about the preservation, the critical examination of digital culture. This was in the moment of the sort of earliest dot-com bubble. It was also a moment when searching, and this is to remind you, so I did the program in 97. I'm quite old in, in parlance of, of, of John's taxonomy here. But it was also a moment, and this is what I have to remind, um, so great to see some of my students, but I always say that um, it was a moment before um, image search, right? We were looking at top-down directories, and um, image search did not exist. And Rhizome established a toehold for network-based art practices and helped to foster what can now be thought of as the first wave of critical discourse on network culture. It had a broadcast, um, public broadcast audience model that was just not only a metaphor for membership, but it offered a type of operational um, ethos with the decided purpose of bridging new media and contemporary art. And it is between these two fields that my scholarship continues to operate. This type of critical multitasking has defined my career. And in addition to teaching and publishing, often on the works of artists that I directly intersected with at the ISP, including Renee Green, Carrie Tribe, Sharon Hayes, Paul Pfeiffer, and many others that I'm privileged to call my colleagues, I remain committed to an artist-driven platform and serve on the program committees for Voices of Contemporary Art and the Advisory Council for MIT's List Center for Visual Art. So essentially, I would say as a scholar, one of the things that the program imbues in you is to feel more comfortable when you're outnumbered by artists rather than other historians. As an artist, um, art historian on the board, my role was to point out the myriad ways that new media art, itself a contested category of contemporary art production, 
reflected the pluralism of earlier moments in conceptual art and drew upon its strategies of anonymity, appropriation, and collective action while self-reflexively examining the role of medium in culture more broadly framed. Of paramount importance to me then, as well as now, was art's insistence on making the distribution and circulation of ideas visible. Um, and this is definitely something that I learned from Hans Hacke. Um, and so I wanted just to think about, um, again, in more pragmatic terms, how this became manifest in my own writing and scholarship. And I think it, um, it was also one of the reasons why I chose the ISP and thinking about many of you out there right now thinking about um, this is a moment before um, the rise of these sort of interdisciplinary art history programs. And so one of the reasons I chose the ISP was because um, it, was a, it was a moment to be able to read Stuart Hall, um, to look at the ways that feminism and British cultural studies were were um, core to the program, not marginal. And basically, it was one of the few places, um, this was before art history programs, you could do a PhD on expanded cinema or interdisciplinary arts pro uh, projects. Um, and so the, my scholarly book here that um, Sam pointed to is absolutely a result of that. It's the first art historical monograph in new, um, MIT's new media imprint. And I think that kind of thinking is definitely um, residual from the type of uh, being at the ISP. And then more recently, I'll just point to this publication. So when I look at paradigm shifts, I mean, that was the lesson I learned from Greg Bordowitz in the way in which thinking about the doxa of the ISP, as John um, evoked, um, as a way to kind of think about, well, how do we mark change? And so the ISP just had its 50th anniversary, the golden anniversary of it. And so we're coming off of a bit of a hagiography about the, ex, um, about the program itself. So one of the things I wanted to think about was can we think a little bit more critically about its self-replicating aspects of the program and that while it made space um, for an incredible diversity of artists thinking, I would say within art history itself, that hasn't borne itself out. Um, and that's one of the things that I think we could probably discuss a little further. One point of um, interest that I took was this recent catalog for the Judson Dance Theater exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. So if you were in MoMA at New York um, in the last um, six months, this exhibition was on view in the third floor there. And it seems very subtle, but I'll just wanted to sort of close on thinking about the way in which my contribution to this book was to write about Elaine Summers, a woman who um, invented the term intermedia um, and having a place for it in the kind of orthodoxy of a, of a MoMA exhibition. And I love this cover because this exhibition became interesting to me because it placed film as the foreground of a visual art paradigm. And so it, maybe it's really subtle, and this is what we do as art historians, focus on these subtle, subtle elements. Um, so that even on the cover, right, we look at the ways in which um, many of us working on media and, and dance and interdisciplinary practices analyze, frankly, photographs and documentation. And one of the things that I was really um, proud and interested in is the way that our scholarship on intermedia forced the museum to actually look at moving image. And that was one of the key things for that exhibition for me. So I try to end on a, a little bit of an optimistic note there. Um, but I do think that when we think about a couple of issues to open up for conversation, one of the questions I had was to think about the ways that um, museums now, or the ISP being grounded in a museum rather than an academic program or a kind of commercial venue as a way to triangulate those kinds of spheres of art production could be an interesting point of conversation. And while museums are scrambling to make provisional spaces for artists of color or to deaccession work to correct their blind spots in collections, um, I would say that kind of diversity is not happening in anthologies, textbooks, uh, within art history itself. So that's one of the charges I think that we bring to my field in particular, and that's the kind of charge that I find, um, or, or the kind of questions I want to be asking now. And I'll just, just to give you a flavor for the program and the kind of what John said, orthodoxy and, and kind of um, asceticism of the program, you know, these are the kind of um, what Hubie Copeland sort of talked about was that you know, this is not a hugely resourced program. Essentially, it's a chalkboard, a table, and a room. And so you can kind of see both, I think, in the listing of names, but maybe also the omission of names, the kind of um, program and the guests and the sort of models there. So thank you.
Thank you to, uh, to John and Gloria for those, those wonderful talks, kind of framing. Oh, sorry. Um, and, and welcome also to, to Hans. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for, for coming and, and speaking about your work with the ISP um, and helping us expand a little bit of this exhibition that we've organized, organized here. So thank you again. And um, just, to, just to hear a bit from you, Hans, I was hoping to just start uh, by asking you uh, a little bit about your involvement in the ISP. Um, when did you start um, working with them? H how did you get involved with working with them? And why have you continued to participate with the ISP um, as an educator? Well, uh, one of our, my problems uh, answering such a question is that I'm pretty old and my memory is not reliable. <laughs> okay. No problem. I s believe it was in the early 80s mm -hmm. uh, that I was invited to, to be one of the seminar visitors. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was perhaps uh, on Broadway or Actually, I, I do remember a few other places mm -hmm. where it was. And I don't know when the shift in venue uh, occurred. And it was uh, Ron, Ron Clark, mm. uh, who invited me. And at that time, I believe it was also uh, Benjamin Buchlo, who was uh, a major uh, participant and, and, and actually he did the entire uh, semester there right yeah, every he's, year he's still listed as one of the faculty yeah, members yeah, 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 yeah. in the program yeah and so I guess uh, when you were first or I guess just over over the years what's your perspective on um, maybe like the importance of the program or what 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 how have you approached your involvement in it as a, as a seminar leader Well, I was uh, a seminar leader. That, that sounds as, as if I'm uh, conducting a, an entire uh, semester. No. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a regular once a year mm -hmm. for one afternoon and evening. And uh, together, as, as uh, many others uh, were doing it, uh, we were invited. Uh, to speak about uh, uh, our work or uh, issues that uh, concerned us and uh, engage in a discussion with the uh, students. And uh, as you know, and as you heard, there are three groups of students. There were uh, practicing artists. There were uh, curatorial uh, students and art history mm -hmm. students. The largest uh, group was uh, practicing artists. And this is still uh, the custom today. And, and Gloria touched on that a bit um, as, as an art historian, the importance of interacting with working artists um, and having that kind of collision of practices. Um, would you, as, as, a, as a visual artist, would you speak a bit about, um, about how you view that as a, as like an important um, uh, kind of like stirring of different fields of practice. Um. Well, I I believe for uh, people who uh, have uh, completed uh, at least uh, undergraduate studies mm -hmm. and are on the are on the verge or. or uh, even more than on the verge of getting into the actual professional uh, uh, involvement in what they were uh, studying. Uh, it was very useful, I believe, uh, to be exposed not only to practitioners, uh, and, uh, practicing artists, I mean, mm -hmm. but also to uh, 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 people who uh, uh, are following it, uh, uh, 
critiquing it, uh, theorizing it, and uh, uh, as well as uh, people who uh, are involved in presenting it mm -hmm. uh, in the m museum context or in galleries or wherever it may be. Um, you had an interesting comment about how this year's class had changed when we were having coffee upstairs. Um, and it seemed like people were very interested uh, in your adoption of a document that's often known as the, the, the Siegelob contract or the Siegelob Projansky contract. Um, and I wonder if you could tell our audience a little bit how you've used this uh, artist's rights contract uh, and uh, what sorts of questions you were getting from the younger generation of artists at the ISP this year. Well, um, uh, it so happened that two weeks ago uh, I did my annual uh, appearance. Uh, and uh, when I had done my presentation uh, in the Q&A, uh, it was the first question and the question that dominated uh, the discussion until the end uh, was the, as uh, John mentioned, the so-called uh, Siegelob contract. And that made me realize that perhaps Today, the current uh, generation of uh, uh, young artists uh, are living through a period that matched the early 70s when the Siegelop contract uh, was in fact uh, designed. Seth Siegelop uh, was a friend of artists and promoter of artists uh, and uh, uh, had sort of a, a non-for-profit uh, gallery for a while, uh, hanging out uh, with uh, all sorts of people, uh, Carl Andre, uh, Lucy Lippard, uh, a lot of people that uh, uh, you find in, in history books by now. And the early 70s was uh, a, a very activist uh, period uh, in the art world. It was uh, the Vietnam War. It was when the when major uh, 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 demonstrations uh, uh, occurred not only against the war but also uh, uh, against uh, the uh, uh, the non acceptance in the official society of uh, non white. Uh, 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 people. Uh, it also was the first stirring, but really very, very early in the game, uh, of feminism. Uh, it was uh, the time when the so called Art Workers Coalition was f formed, and uh, to that the term uh, maybe is uh, already significant. There were art artists who called themselves art workers, mm -hmm. not uh, the ones with the halo. They were workers. And they challenged museums, and they challenged the practices of the art world at the time. Uh, and a part of that uh, was uh, that they also uh, challenged the way the work of artists, uh, once it was sold, uh, slipped out of uh, their control totally. And Cecil Gulop, together with a, uh, an attorney, developed a, a prototypical uh, contract which uh, uh, required that if, oh no, of course it to begin with, it required that the artist insisted on a collector uh, to, to sign the contract. At, but it insisted that the artist uh, reserve certain rights, uh, rights where the work can be exhibited, 
among others, uh, if there is something to be done to the work to repair it or uh, that the artists uh, be involved. Uh, but also that if the work is resold by the collector and it is sold for a profit, that the artist, the one who made it, will receive 15% of the profit. And that is uh, one uh, reason why a, a lot of uh, collectors didn't want to get close to any artist who would demand that. Mm. But it inspired us at the time and uh, I adopted it and a number of other artists uh, did, uh, among them uh, Saul Lewitt and uh, various others. Uh, but uh, as I uh, indicated already, it uh, was uh, not promoting sales and somebody who depended on sales or had an urge to become a, a, a wealthy artist for the, uh, that person, uh, it was not a good uh, uh, approach. Uh, Hans, I was going to ask you yeah. just to kind of dovetail or sort of detour a little bit was to think about the role of pedagogy because I think that was one of the other terms that we'd been talking a little bit about and thinking about especially in your work, one of the questions I always have is the way in which to think about students versus citizens versus activists. And in terms of, ver you know, nowadays we call people audiences, right? And thinking about the ways in which the nomenclature of the 70s has changed. And I was hoping you could speak a little bit about pedagogy um, manifesting in terms of teaching both, like I said, um, citizens or student citizens and student activists. I I believe the uh, the term participation mm -hmm. on the uh, on the part of visitors of art galleries in or with uh, in the work or with the artists mm -hmm. also originated in those days in the late Absolutely. 60s, early yeah. 70s. Mm -hmm. And I also was involved in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still uh, occasionally do works that require uh, the physical or uh, participation and, and uh, uh, the traditional attitude uh, that was fostered by museums and uh, in the past was that uh, uh, visitors come to just uh, uh, stand in awe right. in front of uh, uh, what is exhibited. Today th it has changed, but uh, today uh, they come with their smartphones and take photos and they walk off. They don't look at anything anymore. <laughs> it's uh, quite a, a scene. And uh, sometimes uh, when I, uh, with my camera uh, at a museum, I take photographs of people taking photographs. <laughs> uh, and can I just interject to just to, uh, as a segue from that, uh, talking about your piece that we have in the gallery, uh, We All Are the People, um, it being uh, a multiple that you want the viewer to come and take away with them and help spread, spread the artwork as, like you said, part, uh, par participat participatory aspect of the work. Um, I was wondering, you know, it's, it's been shown in many different iterations, but if, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, about that, about your intent for that, um, and how it, how it kind of fits in with your larger practice. Well, the, uh, the poster that uh, you can uh, take away uh, when you go to the gallery here is uh, derived from a project that I did for Documenta in 1960. Uh, in 2017. Uh, in Europe, 
Exactly. As is the case in this country, uh, we are uh, uh, facing a, a, a revival uh, of xenophobia and uh, what is uh, currently called populism mm. and the word people is uh, claimed by one group as their own and nobody else can claim that they are part of the people, the American people, the German people, etc., etc. And uh, the history to this particular thing uh, uh, is peculiar to Germany, but uh, it has resonance wherever you go, because uh, the people, Le Peuple, das Volk, uh, has a politically charged uh, meaning wherever you go, and probably had for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1989, uh, the East Germans uh, rebelled against the uh, communist regime in East Berlin, who claimed that they represented the people, and they call themselves, uh, the, the, the police was called the people's police, the parliament was the people's uh, 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 parliament, et cetera, et cetera. And they went out into the street and they uh, claimed, we are the people. It was really a, a sort of a revolution and it succeeded. In 1989 was the end of the East German regime. But uh, the term took on a different uh, connotation um, within 10 years or so. It was uh, usurped by right-wing nationalist groups in Germany. And when I was asked to uh, commemorate, uh, like other artists uh, asked to, to uh, make a proposition for a, a permanent installation in Leipzig where the, the slogan was coined and where people uh, had uh, uh, demonstrations shouting, we are the people. I. Uh, propose that instead of saying we are the people uh, to specify who we are, namely all. We all are the people. Not only the, the, the natives, but everyone who happens to live. Uh, and that is, for that matter, uh, came up in, in a conversation earlier today, uh, something that Bertolt Brecht uh, spoke about when he was in exile. Uh, uh, he had to leave Germany in the 30s when the Nazis took over. He wrote uh, 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 essays about the five difficulties of writing the truth. And one of these difficulties was uh, uh, it, it, I mean one of these, he uh, proposed that the term folk, people, be replaced by the word de folkerung, which is population, which means everybody who happens to live in uh, a country. And that is, in a way, what I picked up. Could you just give a brief translation of the inscription on the outside of that uh, building for people? How your work is dialoguing with the uh, uh, official host, I guess? Well, uh, I'm happy and at the same time I'm, I'm, I'm very unhappy uh, that there is a need for this at the moment. Uh, 
uh, and it so happens that it's uh, more in East Germany than in West Germany, but uh, I, I don't want to make a, uh, a divisive uh, uh, comment, but uh, in East Germany, in, in, in uh, Saxony, there is uh, a demand for uh, using what I did at Documenta with the banner, the rainbow colors and the, the, the uh, translations of uh, the slogan, we all are the people into the languages of uh, the predominant migrants and refugees in Germany. Uh, that uh, means something uh, there right now. There are uh, right-wing uh, riots, all sorts of nasty th things are happening there. And this was uh, uh, put up uh, last year on the facade of the art school in uh, Leipzig, uh, an old building, and above it is a superb dedication. It says, uh, to the beauty and honor of the fatherland. And it couldn't be better. Now, it could, could also be said <laughs> motherland, yeah. but uh, that's another story. <laughs> So I, I um, was very interested when you and I talked before, Gloria, about um, the different pedagogical models that you felt kind of traveled with you from New York when you did the ISP in the late 90s out to the West Coast. And so I wonder if you might just talk um, a little bit about your own experience uh, working with artists on the West Coast and then also um, ways in which the ISP pedagogical model um, gets moved into contemporary art practice. Um, so certainly we saw that happening with like 16 Beaver um, and various collectives in New York that kind of open sourced the ISP, but there were also some interesting uh, examples that you mentioned on the West Coast. Well, that was just another way to kind of thinking about what other, um, this idea that um, dialogue is free, right? So one of the things that was interesting to me was about the ISP both being very codified, right? And they're kind of running along an admissions program and running through kind of a, a kind of codification of uh, intellectual exchange that then I think in many ways um, that term independent was taken up and, and I wouldn't say it was the basis of it, but I'm interested to hear from many folks in the room too to think about the ways in which um, especially on the West Coast, there was an interest in thinking about um, in the face of a rising, the rapacious way that MFA programs and pre-professionalization sort of took and have taken over or the PhD in art practice has become um, paramount in many programs. Was the ISP and this idea of having a kind of um, non or an independent kind of reading group, Free as well. absolutely, or self-organizing, um, however you want to call it, um, was that something that was viable in the face of this um, rapaciousness around MFA programs and the proliferation of them? And so, in the West Coast, where, or in Los Angeles in particular, where I was at UCLA, um, being in an art department where Mary Kelly was, alongside someone like Chris Burden and Paul McCarthy, you got to see all of those things sort of being played out on a daily basis. Um, so, whenever I thought. Um, you know, the stakes of what we were doing was intense in art history, it brought nothing compared to my colleagues in the art field, right? Where every day they had to kind of stand up and work against a kind of ideology, both in what they were doing in the studio and then the exhibitionary practices. So to me, that was another way that um, um, that kind of methodology or our model uh, brought to bear within scholarly circles too. But I do wonder about that, right? We're thinking about in the, in the mid 90s or late 90s and the early 2000s, um, and especially looking at curatorial programs. When you look at the early 2000s, that's also when the professionalization of curatorial practices absolutely took off and looking at places like Bard and other places now that you know operate MA programs and curation. Um, the ISP was also a kind of proto moment in that kind of professionalization of that field as well. So we could kind of look at that trajectories um, as well. 
It's interesting you mentioned that because uh, we were we had some discussions via email with Howard Singerman um, at Hunter College, who was very generous um, interfacing with us. But he noted um, that he thought that the ISP was almost like a kind of competition in a, in a strange way. He said um, for the Hunter College Master's program. Um, so I think definitely your your comments seem to ring true about these uh, the ISP uh, maybe being a model for a kind of for-profit uh, education that emerges a bit later on. And I just want to, you know, add the point that, you know, part of, and again, we're all deeply committed to the program and, you know, um, and, and, it's, and it's, it's proven to be invaluable, but it's, it's important to remind people that, you know, there's also a way in which many, like many programs here, when you bring in MFA students or you bring in international students to a, a city like New York with no resources, there was no housing, um, no real studio space given to the, the particip participants, right? Um, you maybe had library access, potentially, right? So thinking about the ways in which um, the onus was on the individual to develop their own set of resources as well. Maybe that was good training for the peripatetic and, you know, um, aesthetic lifestyle of an academic, maybe. But I, I just want to make that clear that the program absolutely did not provide, especially for um, international students that did not necessarily have um, visas, right? So it wasn't a kind of institution academic, it didn't have the kind of academic um, resources to support people who were coming uh, without those. So by the time I was in the program, um, those visa issues had certainly been, so it's still no funding, um, but people were getting J visas. Um, so they came on student visas. So I think that probably did, help with the internationalization uh, of the ISP, right? So it's based in a Museum of American Art, um, but at least in the past decade or so, if not a bit longer, um, it's been accessible not just to the most privileged uh, international students. So with, with that kind of, uh, with that language getting very political, I think that one thing that we were all interested in focusing on are possibly uh, both the work that a lot of participants are doing um, in the program that are influencing their participation in like activist art, um, thinking about like de de um, uh, occupy this place, occupy this place as uh, that very visible protest recently actually at the Whitney Museum of American Art, um, and thinking about issues around institutional critique, um, ways that maybe you observe that in terms of the discourse happening at the ISP. I was wondering if each of you could speak about that. We've just misspoken. It's decolonized this place. Um, but many of the participants uh, were key figures in the Occupy movement. Right. So in terms of the, the discourse in the program, John, is there? So I think during my time, um, so I was in the program in 2011-12. Uh, and I think one kind of exciting thing that was happening at the same time that I was in the Whitney program, getting exposed to, um, I guess, many uh, politically inflected theories, some from the 1930s, some from the 1980s, um, was some from uh, around the time of May 1968. So these various kind of romantic uh, moments that might get held up uh, by a young art historian like myself, uh, seeming to possess the kind of promise of radicality. Um, simultaneously, there was the emerging Occupy movement uh, that was happening on Wall Street uh, at exactly the same moment. Um, and uh, Amin Hussein and uh, Natasha Dillon, who were participants in the program with me, uh, were extremely involved in uh, kind of fomenting, uh, forwarding uh, Occupy. And so uh, there was a very direct connection between kind of like real politics, what feel, felt like um, activism out in the streets, um, and uh, what was happening in the classroom. So I think those things played off very nicely against one another. Um, we also moved, so I was involved uh, beyond my activities as an art historian. Uh, I was part of a group called Occupy Museum, so another kind of collective entity. Uh, and we thought about uh, questions of power, access, funding, so I mean, taking lessons from somebody like Hans Hacke, uh, and then using uh, some of the strategies of occupying space from Occupy Wall Street. Um, we, we led discussions uh, and protests in, in the space of some major museums. Uh, and it seems like uh, some of those ideas that began in that moment um, have continued to inform uh, what uh, Amin and Natasha and others are doing with Decolonize This Place. And thinking too about someone like Greg Bordowitz, who we have um, a work as part of the exhibition, his involvement um, with ACT UP, um, uh, just 
ways ways that all that lots of different participants have gotten involved in activist movements with their art practice and with their writing as a way of moving it forward. And then maybe to dovetail on that, I, I have a question for Hans too, and thinking about the program as privileging many of the artists who actually publish, and you're one of the few artists, and Renee Green's, one of the books I flash was her collected writings, Other pl um, Planes of Air. So I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit about your um, dual modes, both in thinking about publishing and writing, um, criticism, um, interviews, dialogical modes, in addition to exhibition making, too, and how that intersected with the artists that you encountered in, at the ISP. Well, uh, because over the years I uh, occasionally did things that uh, uh, rubbed certain powers the wrong way, uh, I was uh, interviewed or, or asked to write about certain things and uh, it was published and right. so yeah. uh, uh, there are some old writings, I'm, I'm not writing the same style anymore. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the older I get, then the less theoretical I am. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that is uh, how f it got into print. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I would just mark a little bit more a moment in the late 70s, early 80s, I'm thinking in particular, comparatively to now where oftentimes theorists and historians and curators use artists' writings and works to illustrate their ideas. I found a particular interesting moment when you were having a conversation or a published interview with someone like Pierre Bourdieu, right, where in many ways um, it was a rever it was there was a kind of dialogical exchange. So it wasn't that your work was set up to be an illustration of certain um, concepts or ideas, but rather this was a kind of dialogical production or um, and that's what I meant, mm. which I find a, a kind of different market moment now where, and maybe it's just a bit, m maybe it's my cynicism now where I think oftentimes um, conceptual work is used primarily or applied in a kind of illustrative moment um, rather than seeing it as the site of production itself or theory. Well, uh, Pierre Baudry uh, was a, a very unusual uh, a scientist. He was a so sociologist, mm -hmm. to be precise. And uh, uh, still today, I believe, uh, among those who follow French theory, is an outsider. Mm -hmm. He looked at uh, culture, not only the French culture, but, cu but culture in, in general, as a social a phenomenon, so to speak, mm -hmm. and stripped it off its halo and examined uh, what uh, moved people to do this, that, and the other thing. What did they pay attention to? What succeeded attracting uh, and uh, uh, attention or money for that matter and power and what not and for what reason? Mm -hmm. And uh, it so happened that uh, these were also things that I got to, to think about, and so we had uh, uh, something in common. He was, uh, of course, much more experienced in, in, in talking about it and, and deciphering what was going on in society, and uh, society has not changed as far as I would say. Mm -hmm. It's the same story. Just amplified in certain ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Just note that that I think is a, a kind of prime example of uh, parallels between different types of practice. So Pierre Bourdieu uh, being a sociologist, someone who studies how the art world operates, how it generates value, um, and Hans Hacke who does very similar things uh, but in, within the sphere of art. Um, so definitely a, a point of connection uh, between two different spheres of knowledge. Um, one thing that was brought up was, was May of 68, um, and I know, Gloria, that you did want to speak a little bit about Mary Kelly's work. Well, I think 
it just was interesting to hear my conversations with John Lynn. So I did the program in 97, 98 when she was, you know, m much more of a visible faculty member and John had sort of let me know that that wasn't the case nowadays, right? So it, it, it has to do with the ebb and flow. But the reason I was interested in this image was the idea that we have a, well, you, you, John said the word romanticizing, 68, and one of the kinds of um, frustrations I think that was palpable in the program was the way in which you know, the idea that especially within art historical faculty who would come back to kind of chastise the, each generation wants to think of the former as being more politicized or more activist. And that piece in particular is a kind of self-critique about that, right? So Mary Kelly has this lint piece that's um, similar to the production in the shoe cover downstairs, um, but it's flickering with this projected light on it to kind of remind us that this is all a bit of illusion as well, right? A kind of construction around one one's own um, desire to romanticize a kind of um, earlier moment of pure political activism or uh, one that was less kind of contaminated by the market kind of in that we've never had a pure public sphere, right? So I just bring that up only because there's a way in which our own work right now and both thinking about like the 50th anniversary of the ISP or the way that exhibitions tend to do that. It's a self-selecting history, but we also tend to self-replicate and the program absolutely does that in so many ways. Um, um, and that's one of the things that I find, you know, I, I just want to be a little critical of. I, I think it just could be useful um, for those of us who have not been to the show yet, um, just to go over how Mary Kelly's work was made. So it's, it's made with lint um, that she collected from doing loads and loads and loads of laundry. Um, and so she's interested in the way in which uh, artwork and kind of traditionally coded, maybe what might have been called at one point women's work, right, but domestic labor um, might be turned on their head, right? So she's taking um, the labor that's normally uh, confined to the realm of the home and sending it into the public sphere um, with uh, a range of political messages. And, but I think, as Gloria says, um, right, it, she's not doing it as a straight celebration. Um, she's using it as a kind of interference uh, that by having the lint, there's a kind of feedback, a uh, slight blur in the messages um, that speaks to something of the sedimenting of history and perhaps a possibility of a kind of critical distance um, from from the original uh, originally consumed message. Yeah. And kind of going off of uh, what you were saying before, Gloria, about that feedback loop mm -hmm. a bit that's happening within the program, which our which our show is definitely looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about those generational um, and kind of like self-reflexive practices that are happening within within the program and maybe within the works. In the exhibition. I mean, I have less objectivity than, than maybe John does about it. But just meaning that, you know, in a certain way, if the program is set up to be an alternative, like quote unquote, to the machinations of a kind of pedigreed program or an academic program, yet relies on the same credentialing and, um, um, us, you know, sort of august names to validate those individual practices, right? It still turns on the same processes of validation and consecration. Um, itself, and so if we look at the publishing um, practices or the exhibitionary practices of, um, it's really not that radical in certain ways, right? Um, it still confers or um, com is confined to the same systems of circulation and, and, um, and, and distribution. Um, that hasn't changed in, in many ways. That's also what I meant too, right? For a program that purports to want to think about alternate and more transparent systems of circulation, um, it absolutely turns on some of the most august and um, uh, uh, um, established uh, um, names and reputations, right, by decree. I think that's maybe less true on the artist side, um, that I those, those images of the chalkboard, I mean, I don't know how much that, that chalkboard doesn't look like the chalkboard um, that I saw when I attended the ISP. Um, I think there are at least uh, so Latoya Ruby Frazier, Park MacArthur, um, Fred Moten, I don't think was on Ron's radar before. Um, and so I think it's, while maybe the cast of art historical characters um, do tend to be these kind of 
pedigreed, often Ivy League professors, um, that there has been a shift in the discourse. And again, it's coming from the studio art side, um, perhaps more than the art history side. So maybe there's onus on, on us as art historians, right, to think about what critical art history uh, might look like or how we could adapt our own, uh, our own field to be uh, uh, more inclusive or pluralistic. Yeah, I was, I was, we were talking about that earlier too, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm very curious about if there were any kind of touchstone moments for, for the two of you as art historians uh, of instances where you were interacting with artists and they really kind of flipped things uh, on, on their head for you in terms of how you were approaching art history. Um, our program here at UMass Boston has both art history students working alongside studio students. Um, and I think that that's a really progressive model and something that should be um, enacted elsewhere. Um, but it seems critical to, to the ISP. Um, so I was wondering if there were like any anecdotes that you had of moments um, where artists really kind of impacted the way you've started looking at, at research and, um, and your work as an art historian. I think for me it was maybe more seeing how the curators worked um, that changed my thinking as an art historian. Um, that I, I, so I was, went into it uh, like many people at a fairly professionalized stage, so I had finished my PhD exams, I was beginning to work on a dissertation, uh, and the program wasn't always that way, I would just note that it initially began as almost like a kind of like study abroad in New York. Um, the people who are now called fellows were referred to as interns, um, so it's become kind of more glamorous, perhaps, um, over the years as there's been increasing professionalization of the students involved in the program. Um, but I, I had came to it uh, and increasingly realized that kind of taking pot shots from the ivory tower, um, you know, was well and good, but perhaps if you wanted to make a difference within the art world, it was important to start um, producing uh, exhibitions or texts uh, that might reach a broader public. Um, and so that was certainly what prompted me to start thinking about um, beginning a, a curatorial practice and eventually uh, spending two years as a uh, curator and as a postdoc at the National Gallery. Um, so it certainly changed my, my thinking that way. Um, conversations, uh, in particular with Park MacArthur, uh, I think were very helpful um, for thinking about the role of archives, networking, um, ways in which it might be possible to, um, to think about a more uh, collective kind of art practice. And I, I thought there were uh, productive conversations going on there, for sure. And mine is more more um, pragmatic. I mean, a lot of it had to do with the way in which I learned that artists, um, like my entire, uh, the idea around um, writing for exhibitions or the way that you could think about um, the way in which, for me, it was, was a kind of interest in thinking about scholarship not as being something as remote, but something that would be really... Um, actually read and lived in, right? And so exhibitions and exhibition catalogs became um, an important venue mostly because this was something that felt more immediate, um, more pressing, where debates could happen, um, and they were a, a time stamp. And more importantly, artists such as Renee Green actually were the reasons why I was able to actually have a space or to provide space was because the artists insisted. Every exhibition I've ever written for, you know, or thinking about for catalogs is because I don't burnish your TOC. The reason I'm there is because the artist has insisted, um, because they want a different critical take on the work. They want a different kind of engagement with it um, that has to do with the conversations that come out of studio visits. And so again, just circling back to that, initial comment that I made about conversation and contestation, most of the artists that I find compelling are the ones that actually um, w invite a kind of critical perspective of their, of their work rather than something that just reaffirms something they already know. And that was a lesson that I bring to my teaching that informs my current scholarship as well. But it's really essentially because the artist ins ins has insisted um, to kind of create um, space for other voices. Just have one quick thing. Um, I, I, so I think one of the great things about the, the Whitney program is the, the kind of face-to-face, -face, right? So it's a network that you get access to, and of course, networking um, is part of the, the value of the program. Um, but of course, right, there are also lots of opportunities around Boston for art students that I, I think one of the things that Whitney gives you confidence is to ask people who are um, important artists, art historians, curators, 
um, inter uh, to interface with them, to ask them questions. Uh, but of course, in this city, there are many opportunities to, for doing that as well. So I would just encourage our students uh, or students in the room um, to think that, uh, you know, capitalize on the opportunities that you, that you have around town. In, John, in one of our uh, correspondence, you wrote a really interesting question, um, and it's about Ron Clark and the idea of maybe the IS, maybe proposing the ISP uh, as as an artwork by Ron, um, and <laughs> and so so for people who don't know Ron uh, Ron Clark, uh, I'm not sure does he still practice as as a, as a visual artist, but I, I know he was a painter. He had a very right. so he had he yeah. had a very brief art career, um, as far as I understand. Um, I think he first came to New York because he was interested in folk music. Um, so he also has kind of a, a kind of a good radical pedigree, but he, he studied philosophy at Ohio State, um, and. Uh, the idea of the ISP as Ron Clark's artwork is not totally original. There was a CAA panel that uh, uh, Pablo Elguera uh, put together in about 2013 uh, that involved the floating of that idea as part of a kind of performance of what an art history panel might be. Um, and um, I, I don't think it's necessarily such a bad idea, right, that art um, it is a work that's kind of in some ways part of a museum, not totally controlled by it, and definitely seems to um, have paved the way. So I mentioned 16 Beaver before, a kind of art practice in some ways uh, that involves uh, or involved um, social interaction, similar to some of people from that, uh, that uh, experience or entity uh, created another thing for Documenta in 2013, I guess, or 2012. Um, called And, And, And. Um, so I think the ISP, or the Bruce High Quality Foundation University could be another instance um, where the ISP is kind of taken as a model for social practice art. So even if Ron is not totally having artistic intent, I, I think it definitely does verge on that territory. Yeah, what do you think about that? What do you think about that, Hans? I saw you kind of uh, perk up a little bit when you heard that idea. Yeah. Well, he, I... I doubt whether he himself would like to be seen that way, mm -hmm. but in effect, uh, there is something to it. And again, I would just add the rejoinder that if, if it is an art project, then it's contingent on his biggest patron, which was Johan Lionheart Cusulo. And so one of the things that's important to understand is the reason why, it, like John made the point about different leadership at the museum at different points in its its um, history have been antagonistic or welcoming, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is that they had a trustee or still have a trustee who's insistent on funding and supporting the program in a very kind of conventional way as a trustee. So if Ron was an artist, or then Joanne Lionheart Cusulo needs to be credited as his patron. Although it's, I mean, it's an interesting case, right, because she was a participant in the program um, and I, I think what I bet Ron, if he were here, would probably tell you something uh, about the author as producer and needing to betray one's social class um, as a way of moving a kind of revolutionary thought forward. Um, but no, I, I think you're exactly right. It, it perhaps is a, a kind of fairly old avant-garde model of uh, the kind of umbilical cord of gold, um, but nonetheless does allow the uh, kind of birthing uh, of a, a critical practice, um, that it isn't, it, it does have this kind of autonomous space rather than being um, interwoven with more commercial interests, the way that something like a uh, collective practice like DIS, for instance, might be. So, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, I think, I think you're totally right, Gloria, in, in suggesting that this should also be a bit of like a dialogue with the audience as well. Um, so I would like to leave the last 40 minutes of this conversation as a, as a Q&A. Um, there's a lot of really brilliant people in the crowd. Um, so, And there are lots of students we'd like yeah, to hear from, too. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, let me give one of the mics to, to our... Thanks, Bonnie. Um, so, yeah, if anybody has any questions, please, we'd like to, to open it up um, to the audience. Sarah has a question on Nate. Hi, thanks. Um, 
So I am Sarah Knaus, and I'm coming out of the kind of Chicago self-organized art scene um, of the early 2000s. So right post um, Axe Street and around Mess Hall. And as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about all of these things that will never have a 50th anniversary, right? Because they were autonomous in a much more precarious way. Um, and I, uh, and yet also responsive to a kind of local context that is ephemeral and like in all of those cases, like within a decade gentrified out of existence, like partly through their own participation, you know, in that, in that process. Um, so I think it would be really, I, I, I'd re I'm, I'm interested in like what happens when these kinds of practices get historicized as over, right? But then also what happens when they get historicized as ongoing? <laughs> uh, and what we, what, 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 it, what is it that the, what is the value of, um, of, of marking the time, right? Um, and also recognizing an ending. Uh, and and how do we know when it comes time for a, a practice to end, uh, e even if external circumstances do not demand it? Because that tends to be right. Like we we either we get overly taxed and we give up, right? <laughs> or we or the the conditions change and we're no longer able to continue. Uh, but if we think of, about about cultural institutions as being responsive to a place and time, do they need to continue always? Right. No, I, I think that's a good question. Uh, and I guess we in cr producing this show very deliberately chose trajectories as part of the title uh, in order to suggest that these are, it's, it's a continuing program. Uh, and I, I think I guess the value of historicizing something that still exists uh, is that perhaps it enables us to think about um, how it has in fact changed uh, aspects of it uh, that maybe uh, have been overlooked over the years. Um, so I think one thing that became particularly clear to me uh, when starting to think about this show was just how international the Whitney had been over the years. Um, and this is, I mean, perhaps even my thinking about this is in some ways swayed by another institution, uh, the Terra Foundation for American Art, who are now obsessed uh, with the idea of transatlantic and transnational American art. Um, but the ISP very much seems to anticipate those directions in scholarship. Uh, and that's something if someone had asked me like two years ago, I, I don't think I would have necessarily said uh, was a characteristic of the program. Uh, but I, I certainly appreciate the comments, right, that it, because of it's attached to a powerful institution, um, it gets to be held up, celebrated in ways that lots of other important practices. I mean, as another ISP alum, uh, Greg Shillette notes in his Dark Matter, right, there are many, many valuable things that don't end up getting historicized. Yeah, and I, th I think also that, uh, like, artist-run spaces, um, which usually only have a, a shelf life of maybe, like you said, like three three to five years max um, in certain cases. Like I think of a few in Boston, like Kiji Dome. Um, uh, and also like I was I was part of a program, um, Samson, that recently closed their doors. They're still operating as a, as a curatorial platform. Um, but you're right, like, what, like where do those voices and those, uh, the effects of those programs go if they're not part of a canon or part of uh, institutional history or memory that gets created. I mean, I think this is one place where like digital humanities in the university could potentially come in and produce interesting projects, at the very least his historicizing these kinds of alternative spaces and alternative actions. Other questions? Gloria, you mentioned um, that this program could arguably no longer be deemed as radical, given the kind of professionalization of the program. I mean, I've looked into applying to this program and anxiously looked at the CVs of individuals that had completed this program. And I was like, well, all right, I didn't go to Yale undergrad or I didn't do this or that, so I'm not even going to bother mm -hmm. trying. Um, but at the same time, could there be a radicalization in it if, say, the reading list were published or if individuals were allowed to host these meetings or gatherings in the same fashion on their own? Could it be a certificate of completion in the ISP syllabus or something of the sort? Or is this really, truly at heart a closed-door, insular-facing 
group and doesn't want to maintain that? I don't know if I'm the best um, respondent for that question, um, Jameson, but I would say that in many ways the, the idea that the program is monolithic is quite false, right? So like any institution, one of the things that we all learn about institutional critique is that um, institutions are made up of individuals. And in fact, the more porous and open that they are happens to do with the fact that all, in, you know, that these are all, it all turns on certain individuals. Um, and so it's one of the reasons why it's important to talk about um, these people who populate the program, um, their own pedigrees or backgrounds and the choices that they make because there is no institutional mandate in certain ways, I would say. So oftentimes it has to do with the ways in which the lessons of the ISP or the, the, the operational ethos of it is um, actually enacted through more of a kind of diaspora or what you call trajectories, right? So that in many ways, I don't see what going to New York for a person like you who's already started your own publication, right? You're creating platforms for others. In fact, I would just encourage all of you rather than to think about the ISP as a brick and mortar, to think about it as an operational ethos for all of your projects, right? The kind of diffuse networks that you have access to in your own localities is really for me the summation of the kind of enterprise of the ISP rather than kind of subjecting yourself to um, the brick and mortar um, idea of it rather. So that's a kind of a pragmatic answer, right, that kind of skirts the point that you're making. Um, but also you have to think about it as a moment too where um, s we have to stop asking for permission in certain ways, right, um, and to kind of write and do the work that we want to do um, in the field to make those changes in those institutions. Just note that it's, it's not necessarily, like I would encourage you to apply. Um, I don't I think there's a fee, if I remember. Um, there's no reason not to. I, none of, no one who wrote me a letter of recommendation. Obviously, I was doing work related to someone who's a long-standing friend of the program. Um, but none of my letter writers were like in, ISP insiders. I don't know what your, I mean, you were coming right from undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. Again, for me, it was much more pragmatic, and it's a self-selecting, what I meant about self-replicating, because you wouldn't want to spend your time in a circle at that table with that chalkboard unless that was something you subscribe to, right? And so in certain ways, um, I think that's one of the other reasons why, um, I, I just don't know if, if it's as gonna be as relevant to, to people in the same way that it might have been at different moments in, in my own formation, so it's hard for me to, to and I don't necessarily think of it as ha having the same kind of validating power as, it, as like I said, for me, it was the relationship with artists and getting to collaborate and work with artists that that enabled. And I don't necessarily think the ISP has, um, has a kind of toehold on, on that totally. And in fact, like I mentioned in my talk, the reason I spent a lot of time talking about Rhizome was essentially because um, I found it quite claustrophobic. And so frankly, the conversations that I wanted to have were not being f um, developed at the ISP. Um, I looked at a kind of different group of co-conspirators to have the conversations around a crit critical examination of digital media that, th frankly, the ISP was not going to entertain or um, um, hold, but rather something like Rhizome was the way that that developed, right? So having conversations with Alex Galloway, Rachel Green, Mark Tribe, people who were not part of that program. It was the ethos of the program. It was listening to Mary Kelly saying, we're trying to find a venue or a kind of mode of distribution for ideas that don't necessarily have a place now in existing channels and to make those channels. And clearly, again, I'm a pragmatist and it's easy to say that when you're not paying overhead or rent or you have three jobs. Um, which we all had at that point. So what I'm just trying to encourage all of you, and especially, you know, Jameson developed Boston Art Review, you know, you saw a gap and a blind spot and you put that into place. And that's something that is hopefully accessible to a lot more people here to create more platforms for voices. I think Nate had a question. Yeah. Hi there, thanks guys, great um, talk. Um, I'm wondering, John and, and Hans, as well, if you could talk a little bit more about the recent participants' interest in the artist's rights contract. Um, the way that you described it, Hans, is it's, uh, you know, to boil it down, it's a kind of an artist's resale royalties s stipulation. Of course, part of the critique against that is that it's not in the financial interests of collectors to want to do that. But there's also kind of an underlying ideology of you know, artists getting recurring payments because art is special, 
and artists are special and so much of the of the critical project of the ISP is to sort of demystify artistic production and the sort of, sort of you know the myths of the artist and so I'm just curious how they're thinking about uh, a, a you know a protocol that is in some sense is maybe you know perpetuating that kind of myth of the artist being special or something like that if that makes sense Well, my understanding uh, of the contract is that I'm u still using it today. And uh, I know from personal experience that it is, it is not promoting sales. <laughs> but the, uh, the interesting part, and this is why I believe the, uh, the current uh, fellows or students of the program asked me about it was that they like uh, people in, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, are no longer uh, in the mood of pursuing what uh, uh, students in the uh, 90s or, or early 2000s were doing. In those days, I remember uh, several very notable uh, art departments, Yale, uh, Columbia University, and others, uh, recruited graduate students by implicating that if they come to their graduate program, they will get a gallery and they're going to be rich. And at the moment, uh, I uh, have the feeling that this is no longer uh, the goal. There, there is uh, a shift taking place. As to a degree, there was a shift taking place uh, at the, uh, after the crash in the 80s, in the early 90s. All of a sudden, uh, uh, African American artists got uh, into the world that were recognized. Uh, feminist artists, uh, 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 homosexual uh, themes uh, were uh, coming out. And it was no longer whether it could be sold and one could become rich. It was uh, because this was uh, what uh, really uh, concerned them. And uh, maybe uh, thanks to the uh, Twitter in chief, uh, we are at a moment like that and uh, people are just disgusted with uh, running after the money even though they don't have it. And uh, they want to take control. Maybe it's wishful thinking, but uh, this is what I uh, got away with. Just, just very briefly, uh, it occurs to me also, I mean, so maybe the law is yet one more area that arts and, and art history are looking to colonize. Um, so for instance, there, there is like an art and law think tank, and I can't remember the name of um, it's a, a lawyer and artist who runs it. Sergio. Okay. Ah, okay. That was what I, so this was what I sort of felt because I knew people from my year of the ISP who were subsequently fellows in this art law program. Um, so again, a, a, another ex instance of a kind of anti-institution, grassroots, um, both for kind of practical and poetic purposes. But I, I wonder if that is not part of the, the impulse as well. Hi, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful conversation. Um, I have a, a question for all of you um, related to the ramifications of the ISP. You were talking about um, the international approach and uh, also origins. Uh, 
So I was, I was thinking about the Occupy Wall Street um, movement, which actually was inspired by the um, Occupy, the main streets uh, and the main uh, squares in Spain in 2011. And uh, as a consequence of that, um, that Occupy in Spain, that Occupy movement, um, uh, gave birth to a very important political party, left-wing uh, political party these days that is uh, very, very powerful. Um, so I was wondering if there has been any ramification uh, in terms of politics, actual political parties here in the US, similar to this, uh, out of the ISP or uh, out of um, Occupy, the different Occupy movements. Because um, I, I think John Tyson was mentioning that we don't have that kind of radical left in this country for a number of reasons. So um, I was wondering if there was any kind of political ramification that came out of the ISP uh, or anything related to its world. Thank you. Well, one, one thing that John and I discussed uh, was around the culture wars, artists like Greg Bordowitz um, and the Yes Men uh, coming at a point where they were trying to create satire around um, this shift in media coverage and the, the media's role in, in getting me political messages out um, and thinking about how that also has really influenced um, later movements, you know, like the popularity of, of uh, programs like The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, I think have like a bit of a trajectory with these artists. Um, and I think even now there's, there's since those, those speakers have kind of left a little bit of a void that more prominent um, programs in the media are also like reflecting what Fox News is doing. So I don't think that these are necessarily political parties, but ways that um, political discourse has, has shifted um, from participants in the ISP. I mean, I think as we have seen historically with ACT UP um, and uh, Grand Fury, and then with more recent, uh, I guess, developments around Occupy, decolonize this place, um, there is a possibility of moving discourse from the ISP into the public sphere. Um, so I think Amin was recently interviewed by the New York Times for his criticism uh, of a Whitney board member's uh, links to arms dealing. Um, so whether it, while it's not political parties because of the way that democracy functions in this country, um, I think the ISP is not solely happening in the space of the seminar room, uh, that its ideas do escape uh, outwards in various trajectories that are productive. Kind of the cultural patronage of something like the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma, right? So I would put mm -hmm. kind of add that to kind of a, 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 a discussion too. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. question back there. Couple of questions. Oh. Hi, thanks everybody um, for this really insightful and interesting and dynamic, exciting panel and conversation that's ensuing. It's really wonderful to have this here, so thank you also for organizing it. I mean, I, I'm thinking about the opposite question, which is less how ISP extends outward and more how it moves inward. And, you know, John, your comment about ACT UP is interesting to me because um, Greg Bordowitz in some ways was much more um, understood within more traditional institutional channels and Grand Fury. Um, there were people who were part of that collective, of course, who did not want to participate in the new museum window display precisely because it was happening within an institutional space. So I'm wondering if you can speak maybe also about the way that ISP was sort of drawing on and absorbing some of the energies of the activists and, and sort of if that relationship um, you know, um, might have been drawing on that, not just extending outward f uh, from from the institution. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, our, that, that that's uh, definitely a correct way of thinking about it. And, and Bordowitz, uh, indeed, when he's interviewed about this, says, oh, I didn't really make art when I was in the ISP. It's only afterwards that I kind of mull things over, work out what my activist practice um, was and how it might be harnessed um, in art world settings. 
Um, but and, and this is a question that I think Hans has had to deal with many times over the years. People say, oh, why, why do you make art rather than entering into politics? Um, and I, I think the value of these types of politically inflected practices um, that beyond, they're not just aestheticizing politics, but they're using the museum uh, as uh, an amplifier for a different set of messages that the museum has this, and galleries too, right, have this implicit charge um, to like study these contents, take them seriously. Um, and while we might be critical of that, I think that cultural charge is always there uh, when we enter institutions. Um, so if messages from uh, fa if Fast Trip Long Drop gets shown uh, in a gallery at UMass Boston uh, and people pay attention to it, uh, I think that's, that's a great thing, uh, that they're going to pay attention to it differently uh, than if it was out in the public sphere or a, or a different public sphere. Um. Well, I, I think we should uh, recognize that uh, the museums and the artists are part of the same world. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody who is not associated with the art world in one way or another is also part of the same world. And in one manner or other, they uh, rub off on each other and influence each other. And uh, since art, for better or worse, uh, still has uh, uh, some uh, social capital, if in that uh, social capitalist world, uh, it is recognized, and uh, if it is uh, a critical uh, work, it is recognized, it, and the media speak about it uh, positively or negatively. Nevertheless, either way, it will have an effect. I think we had another question there. My question was rather similar, uh, similar, but um, it was specifically to you, Hans, because uh, you're one of the artists that spearheaded um, institutional critique, and I was wondering how you feel about being um, affiliated with the Whitney Independent Study Program um, for this reason. And then on top of that, for all of you, um, Gloria was talking about how uh, museums have the ability to provide platforms for marginalized people to get their um, voices out, um, and how that's more, um, like there's more space for that over um, in a uh, classroom or you know in critical theory. Um, what do you think the role of the artist and the art historian is in order to work with the museum instead of, or like in order to work with it or to work against it when it feels like it can't be changed? Well, both uh, the, the world of the practicing artists as well as the museums and the, the gallery world and the collectors and whatever they all are interdependent and affect each other. There are some that are very powerful, of course, and big money is very powerful, but that's not the only thing. And uh, uh, I believe one cannot function in isolation and uh, one can be isolated by whoever doesn't uh, care about what you're doing. Uh, but if you ha can get a foot in the door without compromising, I should add, then you should use it and not be afraid uh, to be under the umbrella of the museum. And I think uh, uh, in, uh, speaking about the ISP, uh, it is a 
very, very unusual that something like this is uh, happening under the auspices of an established museum. And as we know, it uh, was uh, about to uh, be closed several times over its uh, 40 years. Uh, directors of the museum didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore, and they wanted to shut it down. And in effect, uh, her name came up, or uh, Joanne Casulo uh, uh, wa was a, an ISP alumna, and apparently uh, comes from a, a wealthy family. She was the guardian angel and is still the guardian angel. Without her, it wouldn't exist anymore. She insisted that uh, the Whitney continue sponsoring it, and she was footing the bill. Mm -hmm. And she's on the board, and she has uh, uh, clout uh, because she has the money. And uh, uh, the Whitney is in a, in a tough spot at the moment because of uh, what you mentioned. Uh, uh, for many, many, many years, apparently somebody whose name uh, I never knew I only read it in the, uh, recently. Uh, is uh, 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 has or is making his money on producing uh, uh, tear gas, mm -hmm. and it was in fact the Whitney staff, and I believe it, it was the uh, not the professional staff; it was the law uh, unionized staff who raised. Uh, uh, com complained and challenged uh, the board and uh, the uh, the director Adam Weinberg, and there is uh, a, a big controversy going right now. And uh, uh, Adam Weinberg is in a bind because he is dependent on the board, uh, but he is, as far as I know him. Uh, in principle, probably on the side of the staff and of the uh, Whitney uh, program, which is uh, totally on the side of the staff. And that's not unusual. The same happens uh, at the Museum on Art or at the, and so forth. I think maybe in the second row you've been waiting slightly longer. Either one of you guys. Um, thank you all for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, my question is partially for Gloria, but I think for everyone. Um, Gloria, you said when you were talking that marginality is part of both your research and your teaching. And you also said that you found the seminar to be a site of production for you. And I was wondering, um, if this marginality was something that you brought with you to the seminar or that the seminar was what produced the marginality that you then carried with you as your, your interest and as a PhD student in art history myself and someone who's hoping to lead my own seminars, I wonder if you find marginality in your teaching as something that's productive um, in that site. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that it can be as this conversation and contestation um, feeder, but I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. Um, sure, and I'll just add a, a point that to, to your question earlier too, was to think about um, going back to st something like that you know, it was one of the kind of mainstays of the program, which is Stuart Hall's new ethnicities, right? This idea that race, identity, and ethnicity are, um, are traces, right, that they don't, they, that they kind of, they're free-floating and they adhere at moments um, and concretize around issues around power. So essentially my comments about marginality have to do with the idea in a similar fashion, right, the way in which it's not something that I can actually um, have dominion over, right, it's at some moments foisted upon me, right, um, and, and other points that you can kind of um, um, 
sort of occupy and harness. And so I would just say to kind of thinking about those lessons from the seminar itself as the studio, as a site of production, that's where we do our work. And that happens to do with things like citation. And I think that's, for me as a historian, an incredibly important area. And I learned that from Renee Green in terms of thinking about the active way in which citation and props and giving credit and acknowledging um, earlier models of production um, and also the power that we have to cite other figures, marginal figures, figures that aren't canonized, right? That's where the work happens in terms of scholarship. And then to kind of go back to your point, I would just add, the point that I wanted to make clear was I said, and I just wanted to look at my notes, I said museums are scrambling, right, to make provisional spaces for artists of color. And I think it's symptomatic. It's, it, it's not solved there by any means, but it's a much more visible moment where museums are being forced or, um, um, compelled for various reasons, either through, like I mentioned, long-standing omissions, acts of erasure, and intentional disavow. So I would say they're scrambling in a current moment to make, um, to address those, um, those gaps, void avoidances, and, and like I said, disavow. So I don't necessarily think that they have it solved. I think it's a much more visible platform. And then in terms of your question about where the work happens and, and to kind of dovetail those both questions, I one of the reasons, I, again, I pointed to that Judson exhibition catalog was because <clears throat> it's an exhibition that has both me, Sharon Hayes, and Greg Bordowitz writing. And to me, it's an incredible privilege to have your writing in and around those that you hold in such high regard. So to me, it was a kind of manifestation of those ideas that we were talking about. It's a small gesture, but it's a way in which now, um, like I said, to me, citation and publication are deeply important, and that's where art history becomes manifest, um, and that's where I think slippage happens. Um, to follow up on that, I'd like to start by thanking you all for your commitment to uh, the kind of looking at institutional critique and for kind of bringing this dialogue here today, and Hans, for all your work uh, early work on on this um, in this area, um, and I, I guess I'm thinking about what you were talking about, uh, Gloria, with uh, rhizome as an electronic media, and um, I think that I'm sort of directing this towards the artist on the panel, Hans, um, but it, it could be anyone to answer. I'm just wondering how kind of using this framework of the I think institutional critique might be too n too narrow, but um, a way in which a kind of refutational, uh, critical production um, can live on into the age of the internet, which is a ruthlessly capitalist 24-hour project and um, I think has a lot to do with the professionalization of the arts in terms of getting the, the attention now. Um, so, and I'm also thinking about the ways that WAGE is using the internet to get out information about um, and and for pain, Nan Golden's um, project. So I'm just wondering if if um, any of you have thoughts, but I'm thinking particularly in terms of artworks, as someone who's about to embark on an internet project, uh, how that can be, how this can continue on in this age. Sorry, long question. Probably this is a medium, so to speak, uh, that uh, will uh, be used more and more and be very, very influential. But I cannot speak about it because I'm of a generation which did not grow up with it. I am not on Facebook. Uh, I, uh, I look at the internet for, and get uh, all sorts of things from the, the internet, but I'm not using the internet in order to publicize what I have to say. I'm, I'm not familiar with it enough and uh, I don't think I'm young enough to learn it. Is to the population still being broadcast on the page of the Reichstag. There was a, a, a webcam that was on it for 
one uh, point yes, of a day. Yes, there, 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 is, there is a website. Uh, uh, this is a, a work that I did. Uh, uh, I was commissioned after a, a lot of controversy. I was commissioned to do something in the Reichstag, that is to say the, the uh, German parliament building in Berlin. Uh, and uh, a, uh, a website is a part of the work. And that still exists. And uh, well, it, uh, for, one, for better or worse, uh, my stuff is uh, uh, publicized and talked about on, on the web. So it's, it, it's not only in print or out of print. In Gl Gloria and from Rhizome, I think that there's another place where uh, another place where um, online content is in some ways, I mean, protected by an institution um, from some of the the onslaught of the the 24-hour capitalist waves you describe. But it's actually one of the ironies right now. The one of the reasons I picked that slide or that image was a, as a prompt to remind myself that. Um, in 2005, Rhizome ceased to be an independent operation. It was untenable to continue on as an independent entity. And so as a board, we basically shepherded it into the new museum, and that became its institutional uh, home. And so essentially, the other thing that's going on right now is that the internet is absolutely precarious itself. In fact, one of the biggest um, projects that Rhizome's undertaken is the net art anthology that's actually being um, preserving, you know, 100 net art art objects right now that are actually being displayed in a kind of analog way in the in the in the exhibition or the galleries of the new museum right now. So if you go to New York, that's what's on display, looking at both the kind of program software and hardware and trying to um, preserve it or conserve it the same way that media conservation has to do with video, film, and other ephemeral media. But I kind of want to press Hans a little bit because he's about to embark on a major exhibition that opens in the fall at the new museum. And I wanted to kind of ask you to talk a little bit about some of your um, ambitions for that and what it means for you now, having had one of the most prolific exhibition careers, despite the overt censorship that you did face. Well, it's, uh, I don't remember the, the uh, numbers of years. It's uh, sort of an anniversary kind of exhibition. Uh, after I, I got kicked out of uh, uh, the Guggenheim, that is to say, uh, uh, an exhibition that was scheduled in 1971 uh, of my work, uh, which uh, did not, not take place. It took 16 years for any uh, museum type uh, institution in uh, this country uh, to touch anything of what I was doing and the new museum uh, was the one. Uh, and now, that is to say, uh, later this year, there will be another uh, solo exhibition. And uh, it's going to be a lot of work, I know that. And to, to get uh, everything together and to, to figure out uh, uh, what should be chosen, how to exhibit it, and uh, whether I can produce uh, a new work for it. At the moment, I cannot say. And, and I think um, <laughs> one interesting tactic for uh, artists in the audience, younger artists, to think about um, is that, Hans, you often have waited until the last moment to reveal your plans. Um, so there is a kind of political strategy uh, behind not revealing too much information uh, about these ongoing projects. And I guess uh, your first show at the New Museum was Unfinished Business, and the business is maybe still unfinished. <laughs> well, uh, it was called Unfinished Business. I believe that is... Uh, not only in terms of my own work, it is for humanity. It's unfinished business. 
So with that, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap things up. Thank you all so much. <laughs>